is a concern. The worst case scenario that people have been looking at before was a complete meltdown, perhaps these hot rods reacting with the concrete floor and that sending a plume of concrete dust up into the atmosphere. But that would only reach about 500 metres. If there's a fire, if you think back to Chernobyl, that big fire then sent a plume up to 33,000 feet. That spreads the radioactivity much further, many more people affected. What they have done is to remove the people from the immediate surroundings of this plant. That reduces the exposure, reduces the number of people who could be affected. Now they're talking about people further away, staying indoors. And that has to be a sensible thing. S avoid exposure wherever possible and that reduces the number of people who could possibly need treating it in the future. Uh, does exposure mean death? No, uh, and it is degrees of exposure that is the, uh, the, the, uh, the issue here. How big a dose are you exposed to and what are you exposed to? There are many different kinds of radioactive isotopes. There's iodine, uh, and that's a quite a short-lived uh, uh, radioactive substance which can uh, get into the body and affect the thyroid, and that's why they've been distributing iodine tablets. But in Chernobyl, it spewed out something called cesium and strontium, and that settles and has a half-life, a kind of a decay rate, they call it, for, for 30 years, a much bigger concern. But it is limiting exposure uh, and trying to reduce the effects if you have been exposed. That's what they will be trying How to do. How widespread is the prediction about these effects? I mean, the fire sends all of this up into the air. It's dissipated then by the winds. Where does it travel to? Well, it, it does depend on the, the wind, the direction of the wind and the strength of the wind and also on what's being carried on the wind. Is it just iodine, which is short-lived, it settles on the grass pastures, and what they then need to do is make sure that the crops or the milk from the cows still on those pastures are not going into the human food chain, mm -hmm. because that was the, the, uh, the biggest reason for children in particular being affected after Chernobyl, was they drank lots of milk and they took in mm -hmm. all this radioactive uh, iodine into their bodies, and they're the ones who suffer with the thyroid cancers later on. So they will be trying to minimise those effects as, as far as possible. Okay, Thomas, thank you very much indeed. More eyewitness accounts now. Our man in Wood. For either food or fuel. Those are the people who've still got homes and who've still, some of them got power and some of them have still got water. Many thousands of people don't have any of those. I mean, clearly a lot of people lost their homes because of the tsunami. Uh, a lot of people have been displaced because of this radiation alert. Uh, a lot of people have uh, had to move uh, just simply because uh, the situation has become so dire around the coast that there is no power, no fuel, no nothing, no food, so they've had to move elsewhere to do so. And the queues are phenomenal, and the Japanese people are incredibly well-mannered and incredibly patient when it comes to this, but when you see queues for food, which uh, 150 people outside a convenience store, uh, queues for petrol, which last uh, up to four kilometres, was the longest one that we saw. It's taking practically half a day to be given 20 litres uh, of fuel. So... By the big hedge funds, they were just dumping stocks. You had this panic selling, and over the past two days, we've seen a 6.2% fall, and now this 10.5% fall. If we just uh, look at the... Uh, the day's trading today. This is this is a, an anatomy of what happened today. You'll see there was a, a sell-off from the start, and then the lunch break is where the flat uh, flat line is, and then a big another big sell-off after the lunch break. And that came in reaction to the Japanese Prime Minister warning of severe risks to more radiation leaks, which was the trigger for people basically to sell just about everything they had. And we did see a bit of a, uh, a pullback in the afternoon, but still it's a very, very nervous market in Japan at the moment. There's been a lot of big losers, obviously, pretty much across the board. There haven't been any gainers today. I want to point out, this is a two-day losses. This is not losses today, but uh, over the past two days, since the start of the week, some of the household names, Toyota down nearly 15%, Honda more than 10%, Sony 17%, Tokyo Electric Power, this is the operator of the uh, actual Fukushima plants down 42% in the past two days. So as you see... The Daily Mail carries a photo of a four-month-old girl who was buried under the rubble, being reunited with her father. Front page has the headline, Meltdown. Time says this accident is worse than the Three Mile Island disaster in Pennsylvania. The photograph very interesting because what this shows is a dog actually visiting its owner in quarantine. That, that's right, the owner in quarantine uh, amid radiation fears. The Mirror says emergency teams have just two days to prevent a nuclear disaster, 48 hours. The Telegraph says Japan has appealed for international help 
to deal with this nuclear crisis. Uh, the Guardian, the race to save the reactors, the main story for them. The Sun, uh, the fate of 450 Britons, which the Sun says are still unaccounted for after the quake and the tsunami. And the Daily Express carries a photograph of a baby girl rescued after three days under the rubble. The main story, though, was the ongoing campaign about the European Union. Uh, we can actually go to Sendai now um, on the telephone. Uh, we've got a chap called Luke Happel. Uh, Luke, uh, you're originally from Southampton, I understand. Uh, you're there, you're working in Japan. I just went through one of the headlines in the newspapers there. The Sun newspaper reckons there may be around 450 Brits missing in, in this quake. Does everyone you know, are they accounted for? Um, yes, uh, hello, Eamon, yes. Um, I, I can personally account for all of my, my British friends here. And um, yes, so that's, that's definitely good. No, no injuries, no, I haven't heard of any deaths as of yet. No. Our office about women stopping to buy Japanese cosmetics. We're talking about Japanese food imports being stopped and we're not going to be trusting the sushi. Now, you, I, these are anecdotal, but this is what will weigh on the economy for a long time. Well, and the economy's not that strong to start with. Exactly. And it's, what you're setting out here is a total recessionary picture. Is that right? We're talking. It, it's not impossible that this, because of the nuclear situation, if it deteriorates from here, if, if this is the worst of it and we find out that today's announcements were overblown and the market reaction was far too much, then yes, we can go back to a normal cycle of a disaster the markets take a hit the with rebuilding gets the economy going with it could be hundreds of billions in this case okay and that would in the end be a boost for the economy but keep in mind we just don't know yet and that's my worry here is that the added situation with 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 the nuclear accident is going to be a longer term dampener and could knock the Japanese economy back into recession in the coming quarters okay I just want to ask you about a, a much more short-term issue there has been a lot of chat in the market today that the Bank of Japan could have done a lot more mm -hmm. to ease the fears, ease the concerns uh, of investors. I'm not quite sure how it could have done that, given this is a fairly, you know, th this is, we don't know. There's, there's so many uncertainties yeah. here. Do you think the BOJ has has dropped the ball on this? No, I think they've done quite a bit. Look, the BOJ doesn't have much to do, and this is another problem. Fiscally, Japan is spent. On a monetary policy basis, Japan is spent. Go back to Kobe again. It was very, it was, it was a different situation, and the, the debt burden wasn't as bad, and the BOJ had some room to maneuver. Why are they pumping short-term liquidity into the market in the, you know, the, 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 the area of, of a quarter of a trillion in two days? Because they can't cut interest rates because they've been at zero for so long. The problem is they've spent everything. So they're doing what they can do, and I wouldn't say that, that we should be critical of them because there wasn't there was there was more supply than demand in the money markets yesterday. They are there to make sure that there is liquidity in the market. So so that's not going to be an issue. The next issue is going to be the fiscal situation, what they do with the supplementary budget to to try to address this and pay for it. Rebuilding it's like a fiscal stimulus package coming and how the markets will react to that uh, in the mm. in the bond markets, the JGB market. And at the moment it's pure uncertainty and fear in the markets and you can't counter that because of the nuclear situation investors okay. are selling first asking questions later without that we would not have seen this sell-off today okay uh, I can I talk to Professor Andrew Sherry my professor Sherry is the director of the Dalton Nuclear Institute in Manchester uh, professor the situation just seems to get worse and worse we do get these assurances that the things are under control but where are we at now do you think well, I think what we've seen overnight uh, has been an escalation of the issue uh, at the Fukushima plant. Clearly, the, uh, the operators have been trying to manage this decay heat process that occurs within the core of the nuclear reactor. Uh, in reactor one and reactor two, that seems to be okay, and the seawater injection seems to have worked. We were hearing yesterday in reactor two that the core was, was getting exposed to steam, not under the water and we even had reports that the whole core had been exposed. Essentially that leads to, a, to an increase in the pressure and the temperature within the reactor and this third explosion that we've seen overnight I think uh, is different from the previous two. It seems to be associated with a different component, a large torus donut shaped structure that sits below the main reactor core and outside the containment vessel. The timing of the explosion seemed to coincide with a pressure drop within that component, which is there to help control the pressure, um, that would have released more radioactive uh, uh, steam, probably mixed with hydrogen, as was the case in the previous two reactors. And I think that's likely to be at least one of the sources of this increase in radiation levels that's being measured by a number of parties. Yeah. 
Let's be realistic about this, Professor. How can the Japanese continue to cope with this on their own? When you look at the whole infrastructure that's been destroyed, their technical and scientific teams must be at exhaustion point um, as well. What do you think the next step has got to be? Well, we, again, we have seen close interactions between the Japanese operators, uh, TEPCO and the IAEA. The IAEA clearly have expertise that will provide advice. Uh, also yesterday we heard that TEPCO had approached the US who uh, operate a number of, of these boiling water reactors of, of similar design and essentially I think what they're doing is trying to bring together the best minds in the world and also as you say uh, exhaustion uh, can start to play a part and also these people may have lost homes, loved ones and everything else so they are in a very difficult circumstance. Now I was talking to an expat uh, just before you there who is based in Sendai and he's saying look the, the, the Japanese media are not playing this up at all there it seems to be a bigger deal for us in Britain talking about the nuclear fallout um, is that a deliberate tactic do you think um, is he underestimating the danger or are we overreacting well, I, I think there's a, there's a couple of things in play here. F firstly, the situation is clearly evolving and they're having to manage uh, the information that goes out on the situation without uh, un unwarrantly uh, upsetting the, the, the public and, and causing panic. So they're trying to manage uh, the information as it comes out. Also, we, also, we need to understand that information from nuclear plants, whilst it, it presents itself in dials and, and data and so on, requires interpretation and that also uh, requires time. So I think they're trying to manage information that comes out. Clearly around the world, uh, most of the questions that I'm getting are relating to the worst case scenario. Yeah. Is this another Chernobyl? Um, and, and that's where the rest of the world is looking. Now from my own perspective, uh, this is a very, very different reactor system to Chernobyl. What we're looking at is core damage that will move downwards, not upwards and outwards as was the case in Chernobyl. Uh, it's a very different reactor system. Uh, it, it's, it's structurally, it's withstood the largest earthquake loading that any reactor has ever withstood. The challenge has really been associated with managing the decay heat and the pressures within the reactor system. And uh, the Japanese operators have been trying their best to do that through venting and injection of seawater. OK, as you say, it's an ever-changing situation. Thanks very much indeed for uh, taking us this far on that, Professor Sherry. We'll leave it there. Thank you very much indeed. So.